Hello, hello, how are you doing? It's good to be here. Uh, uh, I'm Pavel de Borca, and I've been living in Glivica for about, um, I don't know, it's a long time. It feels really long anyway. It feels like a really long time. It's about six years, I think, maybe seven or something like this. And when I first came here, uh, my wife was, you know, studying and stuff. And uh, so I would basically just walk around the streets all day. And uh, that's all I had to do. <laughs> And uh, I'd walk around and the city and the landscape, the urban landscape and the buildings would scare me a lot. And uh, it was weird. It was, they, they would assault me almost, uh, uh, the buildings and the public spaces too. Uh, it, it was almost like I was being hit over the head with a dead cat repeatedly uh, by looking at some of the buildings. Don't get me wrong, some of the buildings are great uh, because they were built by the Germans, I suppose. And... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and whenever you can see those buildings, when you can get past all the carbon pollution and see them, they're actually quite, quite pretty. Uh, okay, hold on. Uh, the, the, uh, the title of this is The Architecture of Hate. But before we get to the hate, uh, there's a lot of love, okay? So uh, I'll explain why, uh, I'll explain how I got here. Uh, why am I here? Well, I'll tell you why I'm here. Uh, it's, the, it's the same reason any foreign man comes to Poland. I, I married one of your women. And uh, <laughs> it's the only reason to come here. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, I, it was weird because we were, I, I was in Ireland and I was just standing on the corner uh, of my home uh, city. I come from Gaul. I was just standing there being Irish, which meant that I was drinking and dancing, I suppose. And uh, that's the cliche and that's what we do. And uh, this uh, Polish woman just dropped from the sky. I, I know it sounds weird, but that's what happened. She dropped from the sky and uh, we fell in love instantly. It was great. It was brilliant, you know. And uh, it, it was the first time I was in my home city and, and I had a beautiful girlfriend. Um, <laughs> Because I had girlfriends before, but they weren't beautiful. They were, they were Irish. And uh, <laughs> so for months it was great, it was great. And one day she turns around and she says, I'm sorry, but I have to go home. She doesn't really talk like that, but just imagine she does, okay? <laughs> and I was freaking out. Why do you have to go? Why are you going? Don't go. I have to go. My, my babcha needs me. <laughs> and this is before I knew what the hell a babcha was. I was like, uh, I'll get you 10 babchas. Just stay, please. <laughs> No, 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 she needs me to make the pierogi for Christmas dinner. I have to go. Because that's the sound Polish women make when they go. So, <laughs> so she was gone and I had to go after her. Because I'm an Irish man. I had a plan and I had to go and get her. And so I hopped on a, I hopped on a train. Uh, you heard me right, a train, not a plane. Because I wanted my sadness and loneliness to last a little longer. And uh, I went on this train across bloody Europe for three days on this train, uh, uh, 72 hours, probably longer, but I just, I don't remember the last 20 hours or something. So I'm on the train and I'm sleeping with my head under my shoulder and I arrive in Levitsa at the train station. This is like six years ago. And you remember what it was like. It was rough, that train station. Uh, I, I think they used it for Michael Jackson's Thriller video at one stage. <laughs> And uh, I get off the train and there she is, the woman I love, and she runs over to me and I run over to her and we're crying. And the first thing she says to me is, don't look around you. <laughs> Keep looking in my eyes, come this way. Ignore the building about to collapse, okay? <laughs> Quickly, get the priest. <laughs> Because this is what happens when you arrive in Poland as a single man. You're not leaving as a single man at all. They took me straight to the church. Vanda, why are we going to the church? Uh, is a Polish tradition. When foreign man comes, we have big church party, okay? When funny man with dress asks you a question, just say yes, okay? In nomine Patri Spiritus, do you take this woman to be your wife? What? You're married. Bye-bye. <laughs> He sounds like Dracula, that priest. <laughs> Maybe he was. Um, so uh, I'm here. I, I've been here ever since. And uh, I'm convinced. I have no doubts about it. You might have doubts, but I have no doubts that the city authorities of Glivica, probably other cities in Silesia too, but in Glivica, I'm convinced that they hate us, okay? And you might think to yourself, crazy Irish man, how is this? And it seems obvious to me when you live in a city that has no trams 
Well, they used to have trams, but they took them away, but they left the tram lines for some reason. This is kind of like going to the dentist and having a bad tooth, and they take the tooth out, but they leave the bad bit in. And they have the tram lines there, and I don't know if you're cycling, you know, you can break your neck on these tram lines if you're a cyclist. And I see women with prams, and they have babies, and they're getting stuck in the tram lines, and the car is coming and stuff. And that's how I'm convinced they hate us. I'm convinced they hate us because we don't have any cycle paths in the city. Even though I've heard that the EU have given lots of money for them and uh, sometimes they're put out into the forests for some reason, these cycle paths. Uh, maybe the bears and the wild boars have a bigger need for cycling than we do or something, I'm not too sure. I'm uh, convinced they hate us because they have this, I suppose you call it a building, it's a sports hall on the edge of the city uh, it kind of, it's kind of draining all the money away from the city, this big sports hall that I don't really know if we really need this sports hall, this big hall, it's a shed, it's a big shed really, uh, um, to put things. Uh, and that takes the money away from where we should have, I suppose, the uh, cycle paths, which are very expensive, but this thing is taking the money away, it's draining the money away. Uh, I'm convinced they hate us because I think 100,000 trees have been cut down in the last 10 years, something like this. I tried to find out how many were replanted and the city authority said 75,000 and the local news agency said 10,000. So I'm not too sure about that and some of them were bushes apparently too or something like this. Uh, but the biggest thing I hate, uh, I hate, is the, uh, this road that comes through the city, this new road that comes through. I won't mention the name of the road just in case the road gets offended or in case the road wants to sue us, I don't want the university to be sued, but you know, and I don't want the road to get offended either, but you know, but, but, but the road knows who it is, okay? And uh, it, comes right, it comes right into the center of the city and bringing all those lovely things in, like pollution and noise and cars and all those things to stop us having a nice city center. And, and I did some research on this, uh, on this road uh, and I went back through the books and uh, the old books with the old photos and uh, what was there before. And there was this canal there. This is like 80, 100 years ago. It was like before the war anyway. A canal. And there's pictures of people swimming in this canal and German people walking with parasols and they're, they're, on the, they're paddling away and they're skiing and or, or skating. It's great. They're, having, they're being very un-German. They're having fun. And uh, I'm thinking, why couldn't we have done this? To have water in the center of your city, we could have done this. Instead of having these cars and stuff flying through it and the city cut in half. And I decided then to get very up close and personal with this road. I was with my uh, two daughters, uh, uh, Lily Lola. She's here actually, she's yawning over there. And, um, and Melina, who's asleep, uh, the two of them. Uh, they're six and five. And we had to go to, so we had to, go to Wrocław uh, to see a concert or something. But I said, I'm, I'll just stop and I'll check out this road. And I stopped, parked the car and I got out to walk along to see how easy it was to get across the road if you had to, you know, if you were a pedestrian, if you had a bike. And it's very difficult to get across this bloody road if you, if you have a bike or if you're with kids or something, you know. And um, then I was watching about the, uh, the sound barriers. There's two types of sound barriers, there's transparent and there's non-transparent. And uh, the, one, the place where they have the non-transparent sound barrier it was up against this residential building. Uh, and I could see that the ground floor and the first floor and the second floor were completely blocked out. There was no light getting into the buildings at all. I'm thinking to the people who live here, did they, did they insult the, you know, the president of the city or something? Or have they done something to anger this man? I don't know. But, they were living in perpetual darkness. And uh, then I looked at the transparent barrier where it was, and usually when there's a transparent barrier, it's uh, to show something nice. We want to see something really nice, something picturesque. And uh, we looked over there with my little girls and there was just wasteland. There was like a crater in the middle of the, uh, of the city that this transparent sound barrier was showing. So we were coming, we were feeling really depressed after this and we were coming back and we were getting back into the car, feeling sad about this road that was really destroying the city. And um, as soon as we get back into the car, my uh, two girls, they start screaming in the back of the car, Tatoosh, Tatoosh. <laughs> and I looked around and there was this creature in the car. 
And uh, I, I say creature because in Ireland, we don't have hornets. We don't have them. Uh, and that's what it was. It was a hornet. But it was the size of a ghost, this hornet. It was huge. And uh, I had to get out and I had to, you know, get into the back of the car and try and fight this bloody creature. Huge thing. And uh, I needed a weapon. And the only thing I could find was uh, a book by uh, Jeremy Clarkson. It was in the car. <laughs> This was my interface, this book. This was what I was going to use. So I grabbed Jeremy Clarkson. I know it's terrible, but that's what it was. And I opened the back of the door, and I tried to hit the hornet, but I missed the hornet, and I hit my daughter's lip. And she started to bleed, and she, started to, she couldn't even cry. She was in so much pain. It was like Al Pacino at the end of Godfather 3. She was just frozen. And I look around, and who's watching all of this? is a Polish policeman and this big, big guy and he comes over to me and he's angry at me and I can tell by looking at him, I don't know this, but I can tell just by looking at him that he's, he's divorced and uh, the only person he loves in the world is his little daughter who he gets to see once a year because he's divorced and he's after, he's after seeing me destroy this little girl's face and um, so what do I do? I do something that I know will get me out of this trouble because he's screaming at me in Polish. And so I use my secret weapon and I start to talk to him in English. And he just runs away because for some people, English is like kryptonite for them in Poland. <laughs> but it got me thinking. It got me thinking about this interface that happened between me and this Polish policeman and how he didn't understand me and I didn't understand him. And I got to thinking about, it's no good blaming the, uh, the, uh, the city authorities, really. They're beyond blame at this stage, I think. I think that what we need to do, uh, we need to change our way of thinking. I think what we need to do, we need to, to move away from the past. Because it seems that the whole history of Poland, what you have gone through, what you have suffered, has affected you in a, in a bad way. It has killed the spirit of community here. I want you to help me out with something because the spirit of community, it's, uh, it starts. And it starts in small ways and it starts in simple ways, okay? And you guys are all part of this too, okay? So what I would like you all to do is just to stand up, please. Could everyone in the room just stand up? Thank you, thank you. Oh, very good, it's great. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to turn around to the person who's on your left, okay? Whoever's on your left, turn around to them, okay? Turn around and face them, turn around. So turn around and face that person, okay? So, and you on the right, turn around, turn around and face them on this side of the room, turn around. And what I want you to do is, what I want you to do is I want you, on the count of three, to give that person beside you, the person on your left, I would like you to give them a hug. <laughs> it's revolutionary, but it just might work. Give them a hug, come on. <laughs> give me a hug. <laughs> Thank you. Give me a hug. Me. <laughs> it's kind of like when you go to church, isn't it? <laughs> just a little bit more sexier, that's all. You can sit down again. I could feel all the love in the room there. That was amazing. And this teaches us to turn around to the person beside you and to trust them. To trust the people who live beside you. To trust your neighbors and to trust your community. We have great communities here. We have great neighborhoods. We have great people and great ideas going on. But we need to reach out to these people. We need to start getting together. I see that when I first came here, we had a, there's a park beside where I live. And it was covered in dog poo, dog koopa, all the time. But collectively, the people in my neighborhood, we went around and we always carried a plastic bag. And if we saw someone allowing their dog to do a poo, on the grass, we would hand them the bag and say, oh, you forgot your bag, here you go. And slowly, it took years, but we changed this culture and we got the people in the area to take care of the park and to realize that their community was important. In my neighborhood, it's a small street, but on that neighborhood, there is a Soviet cemetery. 
I take my daughters into the Soviet cemetery to show them that you're not living in any ordinary place. You're living in a city that was part of cataclysmic history. There's an old man down at the end of the street. This old man was taken away to Siberia for six years. This old man has got great history. He is living history. You are in an amazing place. The buildings here, regardless of who built them, they are amazing. I teach my girls to value their community and to trust the people that they live with. Because if we're together and if we're trusting the people beside us, we can make great changes in our community. Will we stop the road? Will we stop them building podium? Will we put cycle paths there? Maybe not, maybe not today. But these small changes of making your park cleaner, of making your roads cleaner, of calling in to your neighbor and seeing how they're doing, of reaching out and giving someone a hug, these small changes can turn the architecture of hate into a community of love. Thanks a million. Bye-bye.